This video is brought to you by True Tales of Buried Treasure, the largest collection of old treasure magazines in the West. On our website, you can search for individual treasure stories by region, or buy our original magazines themselves. To pay us a visit, please click on the link in the description. Enjoy. Drake's Bay in California conceals a buried treasure, literally tons of silver, gold, and jewels. This incredible cache, worth millions today, was interred nearly 400 years ago by the crew of the English ship Golden Hind, commanded by Francis Drake, who later received a knighthood from Queen Elizabeth for his daring exploits. During his voyage around the world, Drake accumulated a vast fortune that eventually threatened the safety of his ship. To alleviate this risk, he opted to bury a substantial portion of the treasure and planned to return for it later. Francis Drake, a burly, bearded figure, stands out as one of the most renowned and colorful English admirals. Described in William Wood's Elizabethan Sea Dogs, 1918, as having the strength of a giant, the pluck of a bulldog, the spring of a man born to command, Drake earned the nickname El Drake from the Spaniards, though he remained a patriot and a hero to the English. Born in 1545 at Crowndale by Tavistock in Devonshire, he began his maritime career early as an apprentice and quickly ventured into coastal trade, eventually extending his travels to the Spanish Main. In 1567-68, he commanded a ship during his cousin Sir John Hawkins' ill-fated expedition against the Spaniards at the Battle of San Juan de Ulua in Mexico. In 1572, Drake embarked on his own adventure with three ships and 73 men, capturing the Spanish town of Nombre de Dios on the Isthmus of Panama and seizing an enormous treasure. He then captured a Spanish galleon at Cartagena and burned Porto Bello. Finally, accompanied by just 18 of his countrymen and 30 Indians, he crossed the Isthmus and beheld the Pacific Ocean, then referred to as the Great South Sea. At that moment, he prayed to God to sail once in an English ship on that sea. From 1573 to 1576, Drake served in Ireland. Then, at dusk on November 15, 1577, he set sail from Plymouth Sound on what would become one of the most legendary sea voyages in history. Along with his ship, the Pelican, he commanded four other vessels, the Elizabeth, the Marigold, the Swan, and the Christopher, with each crew aware that their queen, Elizabeth, had privately sanctioned their bold expedition against the Spanish. The winds were unfavorable, forcing the ships to dock at Falmouth the following day. On November 17th, a violent storm struck, damaging both the Pelican and the Marigold, which required a return to Plymouth for repairs. After delays, the squadron finally set sail on December 13th, 1577. On August 20th, 1578, Drake renamed the Pelican the Golden Hind, a name that honored the crest of Sir Christopher Hatton, a key supporter of the venture. This name would soon become legendary. The fleet faced relentless storms, and during a particularly violent night on September 30, 1578, the Marigold was lost along with its crew. The remaining ships became separated, with only the Elizabeth returning to England in June 1579. Now alone, the Golden Hind continued its journey to explore the uncharted territories. After a challenging trip along the eastern coast of South America and a treacherous passage around Cape Horn, Drake seized everything Spanish along the western coast of South America, accumulating great wealth from Chile, Peru, Ecuador, and Mexico. When he failed to find a northeast passage back to the Atlantic, he turned south, seeking a safe harbor to refit his increasingly leaky ship. In The World Encompassed, published in London in 1628, Francis Fletcher, the ship's minister on the voyage, recounts how, at 38 degrees, 30 minutes, we found a convenient and suitable harbor, and on June 17th, we anchored there, remaining until July 23rd. This harbor, located in present-day California, is now known as Drake's Bay, situated 36 miles north of the Golden Gate and just south of Point Reyes. Upon landing, Drake and his crew encountered the local Indians, who were remarkably friendly and appeared to be fascinated by both the ship and the unfamiliar white men who had arrived out of the sea. Their behavior suggested they viewed the Englishmen as some sort of divine beings. 
Despite Drake's attempts to dissuade them of this notion, he was met with little success. One Indian chieftain adorned in furs and feathers approached Drake, bearing three long chains made of a bone-like material. The chieftain placed a feathered headdress on Drake's head and draped the chains around his shoulders, proclaiming him either their king or a god. Historical studies of the customs and culture of these indigenous people have identified them as the Coast Miwok tribe, prominent in California at that time. The white cliffs surrounding the bay reminded Drake of the white cliffs of Dover and Dorset, prompting him to name the uncharted territory Nova Albion, a poetic Latin reference to England. In his notes, Francis Fletcher wrote, Before we departed, our general caused a monument to be erected to mark our presence, as well as Her Majesty's and her successor's claim to the kingdom. This monument consisted of a brass plate firmly affixed to a sturdy post, engraved with Her Grace's name, the date of our arrival, and the formal surrender of the province and kingdom by the king and people into Her Majesty's hands. It also included Her Highness's portrait and coat of arms, alongside a sixpence coin visible through a purposely made hole in the plate, with our general's name inscribed beneath. After leaving California, Drake navigated across the Pacific, visiting the Palau Islands, the Moluccas, and Java. On November 4, 1579, at Ternate, the Golden Hind anchored and loaded six tons of cloves, a fact corroborated by modern references. After crossing the Indian Ocean and circling the Cape of Good Hope, Drake returned to Plymouth Sound on September 26, 1580. Overjoyed with his achievements, Queen Elizabeth knighted him as Sir Francis Drake. Following more adventures at sea, Drake served as Vice Admiral under Lord Howard and played a pivotal role in defeating the formidable Spanish Armada that threatened England. Tragically, on the night of January 29, 1596, the seasoned sailor succumbed to dysentery and fever off Portobello and was buried at sea in a lead coffin. This concludes the tale of Sir Francis Drake. But what about the rumored tons of buried treasure he allegedly left behind at Drake's Bay in California? Historical records, nearly 400 years old, provide insights into Drake's treasure hall. While cruising up the west coast of South America, Drake encountered a Spanish ship, Grand Captain of the South, anchored off Valparaiso, Chile, from which he seized 60,000 pesos in gold and a large golden crucifix adorned with emeralds. Near Tarapaca, Peru, a shore party discovered a Spaniard sleeping on a hillside, with several mules nearby carrying 13 bars of silver, valued at 4,000 ducats. The silver was confiscated while its guardian slept. Further along, the party met another Spaniard leading eight llamas, each burdened with 100 pounds of silver, totaling 800 pounds, which were also taken. At the port of Arica, Drake seized 57 bars of silver weighing 1,140 pounds from an unidentified Spanish vessel. In Lima, the capital of Peru, Drake learned that a treasure-laden ship had departed just two weeks earlier, heading for Panama. Pursuing the ship, he managed to overtake and board it just north of the equator. This vessel was the Nuestra Señora de la Concepción, also known as the Cacafuego. Despite being unarmed and carrying only 11 crew members, the Golden Hinda was laden with a substantial treasure. According to William Wood, the full extent of the treasure has never been disclosed, but it certainly amounted to the equivalent of millions in today's currency, 1918. Among the official items were 13 chests of pieces of eight, 80 pounds of pure gold, various jewels and plate, 26 tons of silver, and unspecified sundries. From Paita, Drake's men boarded another ship en route to Panama, seizing a large golden crucifix and a bag of elongated emeralds. At Guayaquil, Ecuador, they confiscated 80 pounds of gold from another vessel. Near Cape San Francisco, they captured a fifth ship containing 15,000 pesos in gold. In Guatulco, Mexico, the crew took a bushel pot filled with silver reels, a gold chain, silver church vessels, and an assortment of jewels. Overall, Drake's plunder included 75,000 pesos in gold, 160 pounds of gold bullion, 13 chests of coins, silver bars worth 4,000 ducats, and 27 tons of silver, alongside various emeralds, jewels, and church objects. 
The estimated total haul was around 35 tons, a significant consideration given that the Golden Hinda was not a large ship. Originally built in France, the vessel measured 78 feet in length and 22 feet in width, with a hold only 10 feet deep. Designed for offensive operations, she carried 18 guns. Twelve of these were believed to be sakers, weighing 2,000 pounds each, while the other six, known as minions, weighed 1,000 pounds each. Consequently, her main armament alone weighed 15 tons. Adding to this were approximately five tons of crew, along with provisions, water, and ship's gear. As the ship neared the California coast, she was so heavily overloaded that she was literally coming apart at the seams. During their 37-day stay in Drake's Bay, the crew overhauled the ship, scraping and caulking her leaky hull. To do this, they had to partially unload the vessel. According to George M. Thompson's Sir Francis Drake, 1972, the Golden Hind had become a floating hazard, heavily burdened with metal that served as ballast. After discovering leaks, the crew decided to put ashore the precious cargo and build a fort for its protection. They established an encampment on low ground at the foot of a hill, enclosed by a stone bulwark, where the treasure and other contents of the ship were stored during repairs. Drake anticipated a long voyage ahead, knowing the weather conditions would not be favorable. Accounts from several crew members indicate that even under normal circumstances, when the ship encountered rough seas, she leaked considerably. Given her heavy load, how would she withstand such a difficult journey? Faced with these realities, it seems clear that Drake chose to leave behind tons of valuable treasure, buried at the site of the fort. Three and a half months after departing California, Drake reached Ternate, where he took on six tons of cloves. The ship could not have accommodated this additional cargo without first offloading some of its previous load. In The Silver Circle, 1963, historian Lewis Gibbs notes that six tons of cloves seemed surprisingly excessive, considering the Golden Hind was already so heavily loaded. Historical records indicate that upon returning to England, Drake was permitted to remove treasure valued at 10,000 English pounds as a reward for commanding the voyage. The rest was sent to the Tower of London, deposited in a vault beneath the Jewel House. A detailed inventory compiled by Alderman Richard Martin, Christopher Harris, and Francis Drake, endorsed by Lord Burghley on December 25, 1580, was titled, The Quantity of Bullion Brought into the Tower by Fartor Drake. This list recorded 22,199 pounds of silver bullion, 5 and 12 pounds of coarse silver, and 101 pounds of gold bullion, nothing more. Historian Gibbs asserts that the treasure deposited in the tower was by no means exhaustive, as it did not include any coined silver or gold, precious stones or the majority of the extensive silver haul Drake acquired during his journey. Consequently, an estimated 15 tons of silver, 59 pounds of gold, and much more went unaccounted for. This gives us a clearer understanding of what was likely left behind in California. Interestingly, no sooner had the Golden Hind anchored in England than the official ship's log vanished. Historians suspect that Queen Elizabeth had the log suppressed to keep the exact location of the buried treasure secret. The first recorded search for this treasure occurred in 1868. In October of that year, a group of six Englishmen arrived in America for a specific purpose and set out on a hunting trip around Drake's Bay. Weeks later, one member of the group appeared in San Francisco, purchasing several small trunks to take back to their camp. Shortly after, the entire party packed up and returned to England, leading many to speculate about their true intentions. A newfound acquaintance of one of the men claimed they had brought a chart created by one of Sir Francis Drake's crew. Using this chart, they had diligently searched for the treasure believed to be buried by the Golden Hinds crew, though the Englishmen declined to disclose whether they had found anything valuable. In 1875, an anchor of early design was discovered in Drake's Bay and later taken to Port Townsend, Washington, where it was displayed on a local wharf. After several years, it disappeared, leading to speculation that it might have belonged to Drake's ship. For years, there were no significant discoveries related to the Drake treasure trove until a resident of Pebble Beach made a remarkable find in June 1934. While strolling along the shore of Moss Beach on the Monterey Peninsula, he noticed an unusual bottle half buried in the sand. 
The crudely molded green and purple glass was encrusted with small barnacles and felt heavy with calcified sand. He took the bottle home and propped it on a table, eventually forgetting about it. Fifteen years later, while preparing to move, he noticed the bottle again when some of the sand spilled out during the process. Intrigued, he began to investigate further, trying to dislodge the remaining packed sand. While investigating the bottle, he discovered it contained two objects. One appeared to be a rounded piece of metal, and the other, a slender metal cylinder. Unable to extract either item, he sought help from his friend Myron Oliver, an art store owner and antique expert. Oliver immediately recognized the bottle as hand-blown and a rare find. Using delicate, long-handled forceps, he was able to retrieve the rounded metal piece, which turned out to be an Elizabethan sixpence, bent to fit through the bottle's neck. Measuring one and a half inches in diameter, the coin featured Queen Elizabeth's head on one side and the Royal Crest of England on the other. For hours, Oliver attempted to remove the metal cylinder from the bottle until he finally succeeded. Upon examination, the second object was revealed to be a thin, hammered lead sheet that had been tightly rolled. Unrolling the sheet without causing damage proved to be a slow and tedious process as it kept rolling back up. However, while working with it, the two men realized there was writing on the sheet. Eventually, Oliver managed to place the sheet between the leaves of a book press sandwiched between pads of blotter paper. This method worked, allowing the sheet to be flattened out. After careful examination, the lead sheet was found to measure 8 to 5 16 inches long, 5 7 16 inches wide, and 1 32 of an inch thick. Crude engravings on it read, In nomen Elizabeth Hybet Britanna Ryram Regina, I do claim this great land and the seas, thereof there being no inhabitants in possession to witness thereto this bottle at Great Tree by Small River at Lat, 36D 30 Milmouter beyond Hisp, for our most fair and puissant queen, and Hera heirs and successors forever unto their keeping, by God's grace, this first day of May 1579, Francis Drake, Generali, Francis Fletcher Scriv. The bottle was taken to Boston for analysis, confirming that the glass was indeed 355 years old. The lead sheet was sent to England for examination by several prominent historians. However, they expressed skepticism regarding its authenticity citing that it was perfectly flat and undamaged, which led them to doubt it had ever been rolled up. Officials from two California universities, after examining it, believed the sheet to be genuine, but they refused to disclose their names or opinions for official use. Frustrated with the lack of official validation for his find, the owner consistently declined to reveal his name, which resulted in limited publicity. Nonetheless, Several articles on the discovery appeared in a local Monterey Peninsula newspaper in December 1949. That same year, the owner turned down multiple offers, the lowest being $5,000, for the bottle, the lead sheet, and his story. Seven years later in 1956, while the owner was traveling abroad, his home in Monterey was burglarized and many of his possessions were stolen, including the lead sheet and the antique bottle. Whether the burglar realized the value of the items taken is uncertain, but there is hope that the lead sheet will resurface to document this fascinating aspect of American history. Two years after the discovery of the lead sheet, another intriguing event occurred. It was a hot Sunday in early July 1936, and Beryl W. Shin decided to take some friends on a picnic in Marin County, an area he had never visited before. As he drove along the road from San Rafael to Greenbrae, a loud bang indicated that a tire had blown out. Pulling off the road, he inspected the damage and changed the tire. The weather was beautiful, so he noticed a nearby ridge that looked like an ideal picnic spot. After hiking up a gully and crawling under a barbed wire fence, the group found themselves atop a bluff overlooking San Quentin Bay, an arm of San Francisco Bay. The location was about 500 feet from the water's edge and roughly a mile and a half west-northwest of San Quentin, near the Cunningham Cement Works. As the afternoon progressed, Shin grew restless and began rolling rocks down the hillside. Curious about the stone's composition, he noticed one rock was rather brittle, allowing pieces to break off easily. When he picked up a stone, he found an irregularly shaped piece of iron sticking out from beneath it. 
Upon further examination, it measured about 5 by 8 inches, just the right size to patch a rusted hole in one of the car doors. Considering its potential use, he set it aside and when the group returned to the road, he took the iron and used it to repair the door. A month later, Shin remembered the peculiar piece of metal he had stowed in his car and decided to remove it. Perhaps the light was different that day, but as he examined the irregularly shaped piece of iron, he noticed faint markings scratched on its surface. Curious, he took the metal inside his house and began scrubbing it with soap and water. As the dirt came off, he began to discern an inscription. Excited by his discovery, he shared it with some friends. When one of them identified the word Drake, they decided to take the piece to Dr. Herbert E. Bolton at the University of California. Dr. Bolton's heart raced as he examined the metal and listened to Shin's story. Could this really be true? He set to work and eventually revealed the following crudely chiseled engraving that had remained hidden for 358 years. Be it known then to all men by these presents Ivan 17, 1579 by the grace of God and in the name of Herr Meisty Queen, Elizabeth of England and Herr successors forever. I take possession of this kingdom, whose king and people freely resign their right and title in the whole land, Ventu Hermestes, keeping now named by me and to be known, Ventu all men as Nova Albion, Francis Drake, whole for silver sixpence. There was no doubt in Dr. Bolton's mind that this object was the plate of brass that Francis Drake had reportedly nailed to a great and firm post in 1579. Not only was it a rare historical find, but it also provided concrete evidence of Drake's visit to California. Bolton immediately shared the plate with Alan L. Chickering, the president of the California Historical Society. Convinced of its authenticity, 17 members of the society pooled nearly $4,000 to purchase the plate from Shin, ensuring it would be preserved at the University of California. Shortly after the plate's discovery, a chauffeur named William Caldera stepped forward revealing that he had found a similar plate in 1933 on Laguna Ranch in Marin County. He explained that the ranch, which borders Drake's Bay, was owned by Leland S. Murphy. On the day he discovered the plate, Caldera had driven his boss, Leon Bacaraz, vice chairman of the Bank of America National Trust and Savings Association, to the ranch for a bird hunting trip. While Bacaraz was hunting, Caldera explored the area and found the plate near two intersecting roads, about a mile and a half from the bay. He washed it in a creek and noticed the word Drake inscribed on it. Although he showed it to his boss, Bacaraz was too tired to examine it closely. Several weeks later, while driving along the same road where Shin had his blowout, Caldera tossed the plate out of his car, and it landed in a roadside meadow. Since it was unlikely that Caldera threw the plate on top of the bluff where Shin found it, the question arose, how did it end up there? When shown the plate, Caldera insisted it was the same one he had found. If so, it was clear that someone must have picked it up from the meadow and taken it to the ridge. Investigations revealed that Boy Scouts had been in the area around the time of both discoveries, but the idea that they were responsible seemed doubtful. No one proposed another possibility, that there might have been two identical plates. To determine the authenticity of the brass plate, a team of scientists was assembled to conduct the necessary tests. Dr. Colin C. Fink of Columbia University led the team, assisted by Dr. E. P. Polushkin. Reports were compiled for Dr. Fink by Professor John Lely of the University of California, who analyzed the climate and temperatures of the region where the plate was found, and by Dr. O. P. Jenkins from the California State Mining Bureau who examined the geology of the area and soil samples from Shin's Bluff, including those from a nearby monument at Point Reyes. Their analysis indicated that the dark coating on the surface of the plate was a natural patina formed over time. Dr. Fink and Polushkin concluded that the patina was composed mainly of finely divided carbon, closely resembling charcoal. They noted that the excavation of Indian mounds near Shin's discovery site could not have contributed to the carbon deposit nor could the soil from where Caldera originally found the plate. These facts led to the conclusion that the plate had been brought to its final location from somewhere else, leaving a mystery that remains unsolved. In addition to this discovery, items uncovered at Drake's Bay included crudely wrought iron spikes 
and pieces of blue-glazed Ming porcelain bowls and plates. It is known that the Golden Hind carried Ming China, as did many seagoing vessels of that era. For instance, in 1599, the Spanish Manila galleon San Agustin ran aground off Point Reyes, carrying a cargo valued at $500,000 that included gold, ivory, pearls, and a substantial amount of Ming China. Local treasure hunters believe that the crew may have brought several cases of this china ashore at Limantour Spit, where they later became buried in sand. Given the high value of Ming China today, the search for this hidden treasure continues. In September 1961, a man dredging at the mouth of a creek near Bolinas, south of Drake's Bay, unearthed three golden teapots buried under 10 feet of mud. These antique teapots, which were familiar from Drake's time, were valued at $2,000 each at the time of their discovery. Interestingly, while Drake had fitted a piece of sixpence, a current English coin, into a hole in the brass plate, the coin was missing when the plate was found. This curious circumstance sparked discussions, but few recalled a related incident from 21 years earlier. In September 1915, a schoolchild found an Elizabethan sixpence, the same type that Drake might have used somewhere near Drake's Bay. This coin was later presented to C.C. Moore, director of the Panama Pacific Exposition. Whether that coin was the original Drake coin remains a question, as there have been several similar coins discovered in the area since then. In the fall of 1974, Charles Slaymaker, a University of California archaeologist, discovered a silver English sixpence with a small hole at the top while excavating an Olompali Miwok Indian site. During a meeting of the California Park and Recreation Commission in November, Slaymaker showed photographs of his find, dated 1567, explaining that it had been uncovered from the floor of an ancient Indian dance house. The coin was subsequently sent to the British Museum for further study. According to a report from the New York Times on November 11, 1974, the coin may be a clue to the site of Drake's coastal fort. Members of the Drake Navigators Guild, a group dedicated to uncovering the history of Drake's explorations, believe the Golden Hind anchored on the Pacific coast at a location now known as Drake's Beach. However, historian V. Aubrey Neesham claims to have located the fort's remains in an excavation along Bolinas Lagoon, just south of Drake's Bay. On March 9, 1975, a 102-foot-long replica of the Golden Hind arrived at Pier 41 near Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco after a six-month journey from Plymouth, England. Built at a cost of $1.5 million by the Golden Hind Company, LTE, the replica was designed to sell history, as stated by public relations executive Art Bloom. This revival of interest in Drake's treasures may ultimately lead someone to uncover the vast riches left behind by the legendary El Drake. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to read the original article or purchase the magazine from which it was taken, please check out our website, truetalesofburiedtreasure.com.